Hi everyone. In this video we're going to talk about generation of an action potential. So previously we reviewed the concepts of graded potential and action potential and now we're going to apply them to the neuron. So we're drawing a neuron uh, this time with all of the representative ion channels, uh, voltage gated, ligand gated ion channels that we need. We're not going to draw the other organelles that we would typically see, but we do want to kind of point out some of the important uh, structural features in the different locations. So we're going to have a, a key also to kind of keep track of everything, but what we see basically are uh, the, the, the normal concentrations of potassium inside the cell, sodium and calcium outside the cell being high, and then at the dendrite we have um, some ligand gated sodium ion channels, and then along the axon, we have uh, voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. And then at the synaptic knob, we have voltage-gated calcium channels. Also, we see the sodium-potassium pump in the axon, and then we see the neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter is located in vesicles in the synaptic knob, as well as outside of the membrane in, near the dendrite, and we'll kind of get to those in a moment. So generation of an action potential begins with a graded potential. So we have a ligand, a neurotransmitter binds to the ligand-gated sodium ion channel. So it will bind, causing the channel to open, and then we have sodium influx. Sodium influx is positive charge into the cell, which means that we are going to depolarize the cell. And um, this depolarization is in the form of a graded potential. So we can see it bind, and then we see the sodium ions rush in. We're starting at minus 70 millivolts, so the entry of sodium ions can um, raise that membrane potential a little bit. Maybe we'll, we'll go up a few points, um, and we're making the cell less negative. Now, the sodium ions want to spread outward in all directions. So we remember that a graded potential spreads outward in all directions. And if we think about it, we know that the sodium ions are all positively charged. So even though they're entering the cell, they, um, they, they, want, they don't want to be too close to each other because that would just be accumulation of positive charge too, too close together. Now, the sodium ions are going to spread um, mostly along the membrane because there's lower resistance along the membrane, similar to if you're going to wade through a pool. It's easier to move along the wall of the pool than it is to move through the middle of the pool. Um, so same idea with these sodium ions. They're going to kind of hover towards the, the, the membrane um, and less in, in the middle of the cell, but they're going to spread away from each other as much as possible. So I just want to highlight a couple of points about graded potential that we want to mention. A graded potential can be excitatory, which means that we have entry of positive ions, or it can be inhibitory, which means we have entry of negative ions. In this drawing, we're showing an excitatory graded potential. The other thing that we need to know is that uh, graded potentials often, um, we, we usually don't have one graded potential all by itself. We have what's called summation. Um, and there are two types of summation, temporal and spatial. So temporal means that the, the sodium ion channels would open and close and allow some ions in and then, and then close again. And then very shortly after that, we would open them again and then have another rush of sodium and then close and then open and then another rush of sodium, close, open, another rush of sodium. So we increase the frequency with which the channels open and those graded potentials can be cumulative, meaning that we have a little bit of sodium ions into the cell, we get a small increase in, in membrane potential. If we allow those in sequentially, meaning that we open the channel a bunch of times in a row, then the total number of sodium ions inside the cell is going to accumulate pretty rapidly. The other way that we can have summation is spatial, which means that instead of opening only one ion channel, we open multiple ion channels at the same time. So we see represented in this membrane, we see three ion channels at the dendrite. Instead of just opening that one that we drew, we could actually open all three at the same time. And in a similar fashion, we get a, an abundance of sodium ions into the cell, which really means that we're, we're, we have a, a pretty good chance of raising that membrane potential quite a bit. So typically, one graded potential is not going to really cover it. But if we have summation, if we have multiple ion channels open and or we open them frequently, we can usually get enough positive ions into the cell um, so that we can work our way towards generating an action potential. Now, if those ions are able to, those sodium ions are able to make it all the way around that cell body towards the axon hillock, and they're able to 
depolarize the areas of the membrane near the axon hillock to what's called threshold potential. Um, so threshold is like the cutoff, the absolute m uh, minimum requirement in order to generate an action potential. And in a neuron, it's about minus 60 millivolts. And of course, this value varies depending on what book you read, but we'll use minus 60 as our cutoff. And so if the membrane depolarization occurs near the axon hillock to minus 60 millivolts, we will generate an action potential, absolutely for sure. And so the next couple of steps that follow are, are basically the beginning of the action potential. So first thing is that the sodium voltage-gated channel in the axon will open. And because the channel opens, we get sodium in flux. And once again, we have depolarization. Now this time, we're gonna get a lot more depolarization, rapid and, and, and much more positive, and we'll depolarize until we reach about plus 30 millivolts. So we're gonna let so much sodium ions into the cell that we're gonna reach a, a, a membrane potential of plus 30 millivolts. And then around that time, the sodium channels will close. Around the same time, we will have voltage-gated potassium channels opening. So while the sodium channels are closing, the voltage-gated potassium channels are opening, and potassium we know is highly concentrated inside the cell, so we'll have potassium efflux. And that potassium efflux means that we're going to lose positive charges from the inside of the cell, meaning we'll go back down in the, in the membrane potential, um, back uh, uh, towards the negative. Um, so we have repolarization. And we generally have repolarization until we get back to baseline at minus 70 millivolts. But the thing about the potassium channels is that they're a little bit slow to close. So they, they want to close at minus 70, but there's a, a brief delay from the time that they plan to close to the time they actually close. So what we get is a few extra potassium ions are able to sneak out and we get hyperpolarization. And that hyperpolarization occurs until we get to about minus 90 millivolts. And then at minus 90 millivolts, the potassium channels are actually closed. We really won't have any efflux of potassium beyond that. Now, the last thing that we need to do is put the ions back where they belong. So we have a sodium-potassium pump conveniently in the axon membrane, and the, uh, the sodium-potassium pump is able to restore the resting ion concentrations, meaning we accumulated all this sodium inside the cell, it's gotta go back out, so it's gonna be pumped out, and we accumulated all this potassium outside the cell, and it needs to go back in, and so we're going to pump it back in. Now, I wanna differentiate restoring the resting ion concentration from restoring the membrane potential. The membrane potential is restored because of the activities of the sodium and, and potassium channels, but the, the sodium potassium pump is going to put the ions back where they're supposed to be. So in the next video, we're gonna cover how this action potential is propagated, so how this process repeats all the way down the axon, but uh, but first, there's a couple of other points that we want to make um, just sort of about this process right here. So let's, um, uh, thinking back to what we did for um, understanding the ion channel um, and the ion behavior in conjunction with the ion channels, I just want to do uh, a series of questions and answers just to make sure that we're all on the same page about this. So first question is, why do ligand-gated uh, ion channels open? And the answer is that they open because of a neurotransmitter binding. Um, so a neurotransmitter is a, is, a, is a special communicator that's used in the nervous system, but we could also say the word ligand. So neurotransmitter or the ligand binds to the ion channel. And that binding to the receptor on the ion channel causes the ligand-gated channel to open. Now, the next question is, why do the ions move? Um, so for example, why do the sodium ions move into the cell? The sodium ions are moving into the cell because they're moving down their electrochemical gradient. So it's very important to separate the behavior of the ion channel from the behavior of the ions that are passing through it. The ligand-gated channels open because of the neurotransmitter. The ions move because of the electrochemical gradient. So as long as there is a gradient, the ions will desire to move. And as a follow-up question, this is something that we really didn't mention in the previous screen, but it's, it's also important to know, is why does the ligand-gated ion channel close? Um, so first of all, the ligand-gated channel can't stay open all the time because then we wouldn't be able to maintain our membrane potential effectively. But um, what happens actually in terms of when it's time for it to close is the neurotransmitter unbind. Um, and there's a variety of ways that that can happen. We'll cover that. Um, we'll talk more about neurotransmitters and we'll talk about it then. But it is important to know that the neurotransmitter stays bound for a very short period of time. 
and then when it unbinds, it the, the ligand gated channel closes and no more ions are able to pass through. All right, so now let's consider the voltage gated ion channels um, and the same set of questions. Why do the voltage gated ion channels open? They open because of a change in membrane potential nearby. So whichever voltage gated channel we're talking about, if in the local membrane we have a change in membrane potential, then, then the voltage gated channel will open. And I want to mention that this is specific. If we consider sodium channels, the sodium channels open because we reach threshold potential. Our, our membrane voltage is at minus 60 millivolts. So it's the minus 60 millivolts that's the, the, it's kind of like the lower limit for a sodium channel functioning, meaning that that's when the channel is going to open. And potassium is the opposite. Potassium channels open in response to a lot of positive charge or a very um, positive membrane potential. So they're opening at plus 30 millivolts. So it's, it's the changes in the membrane potential that cause the channels to open. And then we'll follow that up with why do the ions move through? Of course, because they move down their electrochemical gradient. So remember that sodium moves into the cell and it um, has an equilibrium potential of plus 69 millivolts. So it would keep, if that sodium channel could stay open until plus 69 millivolts, then that sodium would flow in until plus 69 millivolts. So it's not the plus 30 that's, that's telling it that it's time to stop. It's just simply the fact that the channel is closing, and so then the ions can no longer pass through. And similarly, potassium we know has an equilibrium potential of minus 114 millivolts, so it, it would continue to move out well past that minus 90 as well. And then, of course, our last question, why do the voltage-gated ion channels close? For the same reason that they open, change in membrane potential nearby. So sodium channels are active from minus 60 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts, and then at plus 30, they're no longer able to stay open. And then similarly, potassium channels are, are active from plus 30 millivolts to about minus 70 millivolts. But remember we said at minus 70 millivolts, the channel wants to close, but the ions, uh, the channel's a little slow to close, so the ions can leak out until about minus 90 millivolts. So with regard to considering depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization, I want to revisit this drawing that we did in the previous video where we showed um, the different values for membrane potential on sort of a graph. And we can show that we um, increase the membrane potential in the positive direction for depolarization. We decrease the membrane potential in the negative direction back to resting, and that constitutes repolarization. And then anything beyond that, mi minus 70 to something more negative is going to be hyperpolarization. So we can actually um, consider the changes in the membrane potential over time. Um, so now we'll do a graph that has um, both axes, the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, and so we can essentially sort of redraw these lines, but we'll draw them in the context of what's happening over a period of time. Now the changes in membrane potential are happening extremely fast, so we're going to measure the time in milliseconds. And we'll measure the membrane voltage, of course, in millivolts. So we know that minus 60 millivolts is our threshold potential. So we'll draw a dotted line there in order to cover the threshold potential so we don't forget where it is. And the actual potential does not really begin until we get to minus 60. So we have a slight increase, and we'll show that as a small slope uh, for the for the entry of the sodium ions before we get to threshold. But then once we get to threshold, we notice that we have this a dramatic spike. So we have like, uh, over the period of time, it's like almost no time passes and we have the sodium ions um, entering so fast, the, mem the membrane potential rises very, very quickly. And then once we get to our plus 30, we notice that the membrane potential is now on the decline for repolarization. And once we get beyond minus 70, uh, we know that we're in the phase of hyperpolarization. So I represent this drawing on the graph in this way because um, it, it will help to sort of put into perspective some of the things that we're going to consider when we learn about cardiac cells. So this um, graph is not is not super important to me um, if everything else uh, makes sense, but uh, in, in the interest of being prepared for the different graphs that we're going to draw of the memory potential for cardiac cells, I thought we could take a look at this one. The final topic that we want to mention is something called the refractory period. So it's important to know that during repolarization, cells cannot respond to further stimulation. They're, they're actually sort of in a timeout, actually. And, and when we say cells, what we really mean is that the, the ion channels, the voltage-gated ion channels, they after they're active, there's a period of time where they kind of need a, a little break before they're able to function again. Um, so there are two types of refractory period 
the, uh, the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. So the absolute refractory period begins as soon as those voltage-gated sodium channels open. Um, so we're just going to think of this in terms of the axon right now, and we're just going to think of this in terms of the voltage-gated channels. So as soon as those voltage-gated channels open, so we know we're starting at about minus 60 millivolts, that minute those sodium ion channels become inactivated. And what this essentially means is that those sodium ion channels, no matter what you do, um, they, can't, they can't reopen until they've closed and then uh, taken a little break. Um, and so uh, from the time that they open, uh, we get kind of like towards our peak of plus 30 millivolts. And then while we're repolarizing, those sodium channels are inactivated. And they're going to stay inactivated until we get back to our threshold potential of minus 60 millivolts. So on the purple line, on the downslope, when we get to that minus 60, that's kind of about the time that we can start to um, transition from absolute to relative. So during this time, no additional stimulation can occur. Those channels are locked shut, and there's no hope of opening them after they've, after they've become inactivated. Now, from the minus 60 millivolts, uh, we actually uh, transition into the relative refractory period. So the relative refractory period, um, the sodium ion channels uh, convert from being inactivated to being closed. So, um, so similar to like if you were thinking of locking a door, um, if the door is just closed, we're in relative. If the door is closed and locked, we're in absolute. Um, so the relative refractory period, the sodium channel transitions to closed. And some stimulation can occur, but the stimulation would have to overcome hyperpolarization. So what we see is that um, from minus 60 until we get um, kind of like down and then back up to our minus 70, we're in the relative refractory period, meaning that we could have another stimulation. We could try and generate another action potential, but it would be really tough for the cell to manage that. And I want to draw a quick analogy to this because I think it will help uh, to sort of make sense of this. Um, if you think about flushing a toilet, um, the initially, right after you flush the toilet, the toilet cannot be flushed again. Absolutely no hope. It, you just have to wait. It's in timeout. That's the absolute refractory period. And then after a little while, there's a period of time where it, you could flush the toilet, sure, but it, it's going to be a weaker flush. It's, it's a noticeably not as strong as if you had just waited for it to recover completely and, and be at rest again. Um, and that covers the relative refractory period. So absolute refractory period, no additional action potentials may occur, but relative refractory period, we could get another one, but it would be that much more difficult. And if we could just wait for it to recover completely and be back to baseline, then we would be able to have a nice strong action potential the second time around. So um, I know it's kind of a lot, but that, that actually covers generation of the action potential um, all the way up through like what happens at the beginning of the axon. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit about how that action potential is propagated down the axon, so how it moves down the axon and what options there are in terms of that movement. And then eventually we'll get around to explaining how, what happens once we arrive at the synapse. So just something to keep in mind as, as we work our way through action potential. That's all for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.